Well, hello, human. Thanks so much for tuning in to the BU Get Paid podcast. I'm your host, Amy Taylor, and I have one goal by being in your ears, to explore as many conversations and perspectives as possible on stuff we did not learn in school. You know, stuff that would have actually helped a lot more of us thrive rather than just survive as grown-ups in an often challenging and ever-changing world. As the title might suggest, this includes anything involved with knowing ourselves, understanding money, and generally anything that might offer some insight into how we can all be happier humans. With that in mind, wherever you're listening, you'll find links to some of the best resources I have personally found to help with all of those things. Sometimes I'll talk about these in a bit more detail, and I want you to know I will only ever recommend products, services, and companies that I am a customer or user of myself. Now, we're all grown-ups here, and as such, you'll possibly hear the occasional use of grown-up language. More importantly, anything discussed here is personal opinion and intended for conversational and educational purposes only and should not be taken as financial or investment advice. That's the housekeeping done. Let's get into what I hope is some helpful chat. Alex, you strike me, based on what I've pieced together, as what I would call the old-school, hardcore version of the hustler entrepreneur um so i believe you've only had two jobs in your life one 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 as a pizza delivery boy and one as a door-to-door salesman is that right have you ever worked for anyone else in any other capacity (laughs) uh you are correct um i guess even the door-to-door wasn't really working for someone because um i was uh, technically an independent contractor so um, commission only yeah yeah, commission only, independent contractor. It was basically your own business within a business. Um, so, you know, yeah, you build enough. your own team and all that bullshit. So, technically yeah. speaking, one job. Pizza delivery got fired. At six- oh, you got fired? Amazing. <laughs> At 16. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because I, I, I crashed the car twice, yeah. Because <laughs> I was trying so to funny. prove that I could deliver pizzas faster than everyone else. <laughs> and this is the other thing. So, you, you've mentioned on a couple of podcasts that I've listened to you on, that you know you actually aced school you're not that typical entrepreneur that was like oh, i was useless at school so i had to be an entrepreneur you were actually very smart aced it i mm-hmm. think i've heard you Apparently. say academically um mm-hmm. and a big thing for me about this podcast is all the things we didn't learn at school because i was i was extremely academic at school but it didn't help me in figuring out what i wanted to do um mm-hmm. so what would you say for you was because again like this podcast is be you get paid if that's all we'd learn at school life would have been, I'm making my camera wobble, um, life would have been a lot simpler. So what, you left home at 16, your dad thought success was be a footballer, be a musician, be an actor, I guess fame was his mm-hmm. version of success. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. what, what for you drove you to just want to do your own thing? Like what, what made you that way? I mean, that, that that's the, the uh, perennial question, right? Like, mm. Is it, uh, is it nature or nurture? I guess that's, yeah. you know, if we sort of dig deep enough, that's really the question we're asking. Yeah. And I don't know, for, for a while when I was running my own podcast, that was the question I would ask all the hosts. And obviously it's a inconclusive, uh, it, it's a question we'll never have an answer to. It's mm. what, what actually uh, makes us who we are, nature or nurture. And I mean, yeah. I think the, on, the only answer to that question is just, you know, that meme, yes, basically. You know, um, you know, are you this or that? Yes, um, because I I get the sense it's a mixture of both. So I mean, me me and my brother obviously were like we we I think they they call us Irish twins. You know, we're or or borderline Irish twins. We're thirteen months apart, so you know we we look oh, very wow. similar. Everyone thought we were twins when we were young, and um and we turned out very differently. Like we we've got some you know similarities i think you know the cultural parts where we got similarities on as you know we were sort of raised in the era of arnold schwarzenegger and van damme and stuff like that you know so we we grew up with a um you know with a, a bent for fitness and for you know being wog boys in australia and that you know that kind of stuff right yeah um you know being a little bit of troublemakers and stuff like that but then there was definitely from a nature perspective uh you know academically it seems like you know, I got given all the brains um, and my brother got given the leftovers because, uh, <laughs> like, seriously, like, I always give him shit about this. But, you know, he, he has to work 10 times harder to comprehend something, whereas I read a sentence and for some reason I get it. Um, mm. And and that's got to be nature. Like, that that, that yeah. was definitely not nurture. Like, m- mm. you know, my dad sort of, when, you know, we were young, like, you know, he'd, he 
made us do like our times tables. I, I knew my multiplication times tables when I got to fucking kindergarten, um, all the way up to my 12 times tables, you know, before anyone was doing, you know, learning how to add up. And, you know, my, my brother just didn't do that. He, he had no fucking clue. Um, he, he couldn't tell the damn time until he was like eight years old or whatever. But, you know, th- there's other things that he's good at. For example, you know, He's very, very, he's much better at being disciplined and fit and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, he, he held the record of all the people that I know. He didn't eat chocolate for, I think, something like 14 years or something like that. So, like, he had this, the, this, this diet called the Cassandra diet. Um, and no one could compete with him because, like, he was such a, such a stubborn little son of a bitch that, you know, <laughs> he would, like, not do anything else other than what was written on his little list. And, um, so, so anyway, w- w- what I'm kind of getting at there is I think, I think it was a mixture of uh, nature and nurture. I think you know, mm. my life experience sort of growing up in a middle-class immigrant family um, yeah. in sort of the western s- suburbs coupled with, um, with my you know, natural predispositions and also like this you know, overbearing father who you know, would beat us up. Like he, he was the kind of dad, some, some real funny shit. Like we'd be playing soccer on the weekends and you know, you'd have all the um, – you know, the normal dads and everything, like encouraging the kids and, you know, like if someone misses, uh, you know, the goal or something like that, they'd be like, don't worry, you know, you'll be better. My dad'd be on the sideline going, you suck, my, your (laughs) shit, you know, to these fucking 10 year old kids. I'm like, man, we'd be so embarrassed. Like, my brother would be like, they're trying to pretend like, who the fuck is this guy? Like, I don't know him. But it was the most embarrassing, like, you know, the kind of stuff that you'd see on the movies, like my big fat Greek wedding or walk boy, like literally he was that guy. Uh, and um, you, but you know that that obviously ingrained something. Macedonian, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, okay. So, yeah, that shit obviously ingrained something in us. Um, so yeah. so there was that, and then also I think my uncle had a bit of an effect. So he he was very, um, kind of philosophy and greatness oriented. So he got me like um, reading mm-hmm. stuff about like Alexander the Great, etc. Like when I was younger, and wow. I think that sort of yeah basically planted the seeds for me um and then yeah when i when i went to university i felt i was surrounded by idiots um so i decided to teach myself to trade and then yeah the the story goes on from there and you took your scholarship money and invested it in the stock market genius yeah like yeah (laughs) well half genius yeah like the the first thing i bought i remember like it was um, – back then there was uh, brokers. So you'd like go to a broker. You'd either call him or go into his office and he would place the trade for you. There was none of this like – there was no smartphone. There was no trading on a yeah. computer. There was none of that. Mm-hmm. And I bought this thing called uh, GYG. I think it was um, – called. it was like some biotech company that this idiot like pitched me on. We bought it at 50 cents and ended up selling it at 25 cents. I was like, fuck this guy. Um, so then at that time, um, Westpac broking had just come out, like E-Trade had just sort of reached Australian shores and yeah, I set up one of the early Westpac broking accounts, um, put the rest of the money I had, started trading options and warrants and kind of like made a couple grand into like 50, thought I was a genius. Um, Mm -hmm. and yeah, then got a wake up call. And lost a lot, went into debt. Yeah. I've, I've heard that story and it's interesting because like, so did you pursue trading, because it was like just a way to make a lot of money or because yes, you enjoyed yes. right okay yeah because yeah, i think it, it was people... my it was my go ahead well like, it's just like the crypto space now not the bitcoin space but the crypto is, space yeah, yeah. now it's yeah. just you know it's a quick way to make money but it's also to me that shit boring and i think a lot of people that end up going on this journey from shitcoin to bitcoin and we'll get to bitcoin eventually i want to focus on your entrepreneurial journey first but it's it's realizing that you know I actually need to be doing something that's creative because people are already in jobs that burn them out. Staring at a screen full of charts is not that exciting for the average person. Yeah, well, well, funny enough. So like, a lot of people come to trading because and they convince themselves that it's an exciting thing. But the best traders cool. are the most boring motherfuckers who basically follow a set of rules. They do not deviate from it. Like they they're like robots, right? Like, and this is why, you know, trading has become a quant industry because it's, you know, it's quantitative analysis, it's data, it's like, you know, pre, pre, pre prescribed uh, entries and exits and all this sort of stuff. Like, yeah, some people can trade on intuition because they've been staring at the screen for 10 years and, you know, they kind of develop a sixth sense for it. Mm -hmm. Um, But by and large, it's like a, I don't know. It's it's a it's a symptom of a of a civilization that is uh, in decay, basically. Um, yeah. And for me, at the time, like my my motivator was um, 
I guess my motivator was like a fuck you to the family, which was, you know, they, they all hated that. Like my uncle was, you know, very traditional. It's funny, like now that I'm older, like I would look back and I would have told me as a kid the same thing, right? But, you know, I was young, arrogant, stupid. And I was like, fuck you, I'm going to make money trading. Um, so, you know, I went and I did that. And then mm-hmm. I, I was in that. I mean, I traded for years, honestly, um, like and, and like jumps. on and off, like what? Yeah, while I was running companies, you know, I'd be mm-hmm. trading on the side. And honestly, like on net, you know, 10 years or 12 years that I was like fucking around trading, um, mm-hmm. I probably broke even. And then if you're just for inflation, I'm probably down 40%. Um, right. And that's despite having like a series of massive wins. Like mm-hmm. I was very early into silver and gold in 2010. Yeah. Um made a bunch of money there and then, you know, bled myself dry almost for the next six years. And then I made a bunch of money, you know, again, bled myself dry again, made a bunch of money, bled myself. Like, it's just, it's just dumb. Like it really, really is dumb. So like th- th- this is, I think I got my, um, I mean, I, I had a bit of a, you know, trading renaissance when I climbed Mount Stupid and discovered crypto for a little bit, you know, I thought there was a new way to trade, but then, you know, very, very quickly, you know, moved away from that um, yeah. because I, I think I had realized that it was just sort of bringing up the old, um, the old demons in a sense. So anyway, it was, uh, yeah, I, I definitely did it for the money. I, I, I did it to prove to my family that I could do it. So it was it maybe mm-hmm. I shouldn't even say I did it for the money. I did it for more. It was probably prove them wrong, then yep. the money and then everything else chip on the shoulder and it's yeah it's yeah. and I think that's where I'm I know that you've got a, you had a little period there where you did NLP that's something I'm training in as a coach mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you know it's it's I've always said to people just start a business doesn't matter if it fails it's going to be the best therapy you ever have and I feel like trading is probably mm-hmm. the same mm-hmm. thing because it just it's emotions it's learning to manage emotions it's learning to regulate emotions learning to recognize your own demons like you said and most people are just cruising through life not realizing that that stuff's going to help them. Like if they're comfortable, there's no Mm -hmm. reason to look at that stuff, even if every relationship they've had has failed or, you know, they're not happy in their job, whatever, whatever area of life might not be working. um, A business is going to show you some shit that you can address. That's going to help you in everything. Um, And then the money piece for me is, is why I'm trying to dive into these conversations with Bitcoiners, because it's just how money is changing is there's like Mm -hmm. a value system alignment with entrepreneurs, I guess. And it's not everybody needs to be an entrepreneur. And I think you said something, I'll go back to this in a minute. Not, you know, not everyone needs to be an entrepreneur. It should be okay to be in a job that you kind of like, but not feel that you have to do trading on the side. And and this is where Bitcoin's starting to bring it all together for me in terms of a value system. Mm -hmm. And you said, Mm -hmm. it was a clip from um, Bitcoin conference 2020. Are you going to Miami next week? this week no no no, okay. no take some time off conferences yeah it was 2021 conference um clip that i found and you said on, on a panel you said money represents you i'm paraphrasing money represents human action it's the most fundamental level of speech i don't care what you say show me your bank account and i'll show you what you believe so speaking into it as an entrepreneur what do you mean by that uh okay um <clears throat> I mean, as, as me, what I mean by that is um, pretty much like I, I, money, like how, how people spend their money reveals their preferences and their preferences uh, reveal their beliefs, basically. So there's like a, there's like a string there. Um, and, you know, I, I guess you can't get more fundamental than that like i i don't know if my entrepreneurial lens changes that viewpoint Mm. but um yeah like maybe i'll just loop it into you know your earlier point which is the um the the piece about uh i mean i i don't know am i answering this question right or am i have i misheard it actually no 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 it's just interesting because i guess it's it's also um, how you spend your money, everyone spends money, but not everybody chooses mm-hmm. to make money as an entrepreneur. So, w- mm-hmm. and, and we'll, mm-hmm. we'll probably jump around with this topic because it fascinates me. But what do you think the diff- there's, a, there's just a fundamental difference in mindset and values between entrepreneurs and employees and the world needs both. Um, mm-hmm. But 
the people that are and I have so many conversations with people that are just getting started online and, and there's a difference between starting a business versus making an income online. And you've also said in an article, mm -hmm. it's never been easier to become, to become an entrepreneur. I generally work mostly with people that just want the freedom of being able to work online or generate an income online. And those are two different things as well. You don't need to be the next Mark Zuckerberg mm -hmm. anymore. You don't need to come up with a big idea. I started with affiliate marketing. I don't deem that to be entrepreneurial. It's selling someone else's product mm -hmm. like a salesperson. Um, mm -hmm. But the biggest thing that people come up against is is the responsibility. Like all of a sudden, they're first of all responsible. It's all on them to generate an income. No one's giving mm -hmm. you a regular mm -hmm. stable paycheck. But also, it's solving problems and actually providing something of value rather than just rocking up and doing what you're told. That's the that's the big mm -hmm. difference. And there's so much around that. But for you, like you, what's your? I guess what's your advice to someone who wants the freedom of making as much money as they can and from anywhere is, you know, do, what's, what's the tough love that they need to realize these days with money where it's at in the world? And, and I guess you can thread Bitcoin in. Just what are your thoughts on giving people that want to get started on either online, offline, start their own thing? What's the tough love they need, do you think? Yeah, okay. Okay, so there's probably... Let, let's try approach this question this way. So there's there's three parts here. One is let's just assume money's working, right? Um, you know, you, you will make money if you're solving a problem and you're actually charging for it. Um, and and you know, th there's some sophistication around charging for a problem, which is you know, you, if you charge too low, um, you know, your your you know process of going broke is a signal that you know you haven't charged high enough for your services like you know if your input costs are higher than your output like blah 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 right so so you've got some sophistication around that but it, it, generally speaking if you're solving a problem um, and you know you're selling you know the time or the goods associated with solving that problem um, you should be making money and the money is your scorecard right mm -hmm. so then the the next question then is like um, you know if the money is the scorecard, then, you know, what kind of um, points are on that scorecard, right? And the problem we've got today is that, you know, the, the money that we're using is um, is broken. Now, it's broken to different degrees uh, in different parts of the world, right? So, like, you know, in Australia, US, blah, blah, blah. Like, it's, it's not broken to the extent that you really notice it, um, at least not at the micro level. But because it's broken at the macro level, um, it changes the the incentives and the orientation around, um, or sorry, it changes the incentives and in how people orient themselves in their pursuit of which problems they choose to solve. So, mm. um, you know, if you look at civilization and society, it's just a series of games, right? And generally, those games are games of like competing with others, you know, creating something, producing something, um, etc. The, the problem we've got in modern society and with, you know, broken money is that we've kind of, like, figured out that the, the ultimate game is to, like, fucking print money. Like, if you can do that, you, like, you own everything. You don't have to worry about anything else. Like, you print the money, you run the show. So the game has become, how the hell do you get your finger on the money printer? Now, because there's few money printers... Um, you know, only a certain number of people can get their finger on that sort of, um, or, or can get involved in that game. Then what happens is the rest of the people, um, instead of you know generally playing a competitive game, a productive game, or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, they they um, orient themselves around a new game, which is making friends with the dude or the people who have their fingers on the money printer. Um, and that might mean instead of solving a problem in the marketplace or instead of producing something, instead of creating something, they uh, you know, basically the government or the central bank becomes their uh, customer. Or what happens is um, because of two other simultaneous games going on, which is, you know, sort of the third game, is people who are not that great at competing um, or are not that savvy or are not that clued up, um, what they do is they sort of generally move towards like hedonism or nihilism or just like, you know, run-of-the-mill fucking game. Like they're just sort of like um, just status quo and then sort of the fourth game is the I give up game everything's rigged fuck it you know I'm not doing anything right so because you have those you know those last two generally like um, uh, it's a mixture of like work and YOLO um, they become Resignation. consumers and gamblers 
Mm. Exactly, it's a resignation type thing. So, so they become consumers and gamblers. Like that, that behavior increases. So, if you're in that sort of second tier game, which is you know trying to make friends with the money printers, but then also seeing you know what opportunities are available, you're solving you know uh, phantom problems, which is people want to become gamblers. So you build another Robin Hood app, you build another gambling app, you build another shitcoin, a shitcoin casino. You build you build all of this sort of stuff because you perceive those as problems, which they are problems within this paradigm, within this framework. But as you do that, you actually exacerbate the problem because more of the hedonistic or you know the the people with resignation end up doing that, and they you know con themselves into believing that they can make riches out of trading and all this other bullshit. So so you got these kind of like you know all these like weird effects that feed on each other that fuck everything up, right? Mm. Whereas if we take a step back and we look at you know what the original thing was, which is you know you're solving a problem, um, you know you're charging correctly and you're you're making profit and that's your scorecard. You do that on a Bitcoin sort of standard. Um, you you have a situation where that first game can't be played, so there's no one printing the money, which makes the second game uh, very different. It's like okay, well I'm not gonna orient myself around the money printer because I can't play with it. Let's so, say, you know, like Bitcoin's innovation is fundamentally let's take the money and put it in the realm of the untouchable. So it's like over with, you know, speed of light and thermodynamics, like shit that we just can't touch, right? Mm. Yeah. Um so it's more more than it's just finite. It's like it's um it's the the finiteness is unchangeable. So so that's kind of the innovation, right? So the innovation here is like let's take the money and let's just put it on the shelf where none of us can reach it. So now we orient ourselves around a new series of games. And then you actually start to, you know, solve problems, do all this sort of stuff. And then that third, you know, layer of people playing games, now they actually have some hope. Um, so they might still, you know, tend towards hedonism or nihilism or whatever, but, you know, they, they actually have a chance to succeed. And then the people who otherwise would have given up, sort of the fourth game, you know, the total resignation, like, they might also have a little bit more hope. So, so it kind of changes things downstream. So anyway, com coming back to it all, it's like this doesn't really matter for people in the micro, honestly. Like if you're in Australia and you're running a business, like, you know, that sort of macro stuff, um, you know, large scale probably doesn't affect you. Um, so, you know, you can sort of take it for granted that the money works and that, you know, your approach to business should be solve a problem, um, charge the right price for it and, mm. you know, Build, build income um, but you know at a at a more collective macro scale like these other sort of considerations come into play but I don't know if that answers your original question yeah but... it does I mean you've touched on stuff I was going to ask you about or dive into with um, Uncommunist Manifesto that you wrote but just to backtrack a sec mm -hmm. like your your last point there about if you're a business owner in Australia or wherever, wherever it doesn't really affect you well it kind of does as an individual because when you go onto the longer time horizons, the issue that I think everyone's become aware of, or certainly as a millennial, I don't know how old you are, I'm assuming in that bracket somewhere, um, mm -hmm. you, you, we're so conditioned and it's it's fact that we have to plan ahead for future, like just having a job, just mm -hmm. having the mm -hmm. state mm -hmm. pension or, you know, it's buy your house, buy real estate. But I've watched my parents do that and great, they now own the roof over their head or they've got that most people you know, the average person, it's like, great, you own the roof over your head, but they can't afford to live. They can't afford to pay their bills. Mm -hmm, it's, mm -hmm, it's just this conditioning that, you know, you've got to do something other than just work and be you and get paid and enjoy your life. And that that's not enough. So people are doing all these other things in their spare time and wasting their energy because and burnt out, which then has all these other impacts on relationships and the family unit and society, because no one's getting ahead and their, their mortgage gets extended by interest rates. There's all these offshoots of problems you've kind of touched on. But I don't yeah. think people are joining the dots to the fact that it's the money that's broken. It's it's not just what we mm -hmm, do. It's res mm -hmm, their, mm -hmm. their resignation is no one wants to do this work. And um, I think, you know, the value system of of Bitcoin is a value system of decent human beings as well. And I think whether you're an entrepreneur or an employee, you've got and you've also got a lot of people in the Bitcoin space that I've met who are dead passionate about Bitcoin and my concern is in that pocket of people, you've got a load of people that are in fiat jobs, a lot of trades people, and they're, they're just excited about when they get rich through Bitcoin. And it's like, okay, and then what? You've still got to, you've still got to earn your, your, your income and they're in jobs they don't like. I'm like, start getting creative with what makes you, you, how can you start a business or how are you going to 
what are you going to do next? Because we don't know when that's going to happen. We don't know when you're going to get rich through Bitcoin. But then you've also got people that aren't even in Bitcoin yet in the same problem with no hope. And it's it, mm, the, the mm. common denominator is the fundamentals of the money you're working for is broken. And so this value system, and I think you've got another book coming up, this value system of just decent human beings are working on a, a, a foundation of quicksand and it's it's learning mm -hmm. about money there's no there's no quick way to learn about it at, at all you've got to put the work in but i'm just trying to join these dots with you know what if if the money we actually use has been designed intentionally on these values that i think no one can really argue with um can you speak into that yeah so i mean okay so a couple couple threads to pull on there so yes the we sort of the the hopelessness and the not being able to get ahead is like very real. So at, at you know at the very least, um, you know that that's a that's a driver for people to you know start all these you know whether it's side hustles or like you know other bits of income or whatever else they're um whatever else they're doing. And yeah, the reason they need to do that is because they can't save. So that you know they're, they're basically running on minimal runway like if you're if you're running a business with you know no runway you know something's wrong so you know they're they're living their personal lives with basically no runway and and that's a problem um so you know they they basically need to figure out other ways to make money and all this sort of stuff now there's i mean there's good and bad to that obviously because you know some people might go and actually build something like that pressure might help them you know, or drive them to create something really interesting. You know, they might yeah. solve a useful problem, you know, they might build something. Yeah. Um, and then that sort of catapults them. But I think that's, um, that's far more rare. Um, I yeah. think what might actually happen is sort of what's happening in the world today is like, you know, people becoming part-time traders or, you know, whatever the fuck else they're doing. Um, and, you know, the, the problem with that is, you know, they confuse building a business with um, just like they're, they're desperate for some extra money. They're desperate for some pocket yes. change, you know, so like, They'll do OnlyFans or they'll do, you know, whatever other stupidity um, just to, to bring in some extra cash. And then, you know, you've got another cohort who genuinely they find something that they're passionate about um, that they think is useful and they do it. And, you know, money sort of is the is the byproduct. And, and that that's the better kind of world. That's the better path. And I think that's probably what, you know, you're, you're sort of focused on when you're talking about the stuff that you talk about. So, you know, can, can Bitcoin help with that? Um, for those people and, and you know at least yeah maybe in the micro it's like if you've got some savings um denominated in bitcoin and your savings aren't like uh melting away um mm. it, you know you you probably have that buffer to think about doing something on the side um mm. because it's something you're passionate about so it's not coming from a place of desperation it's coming from a place of creativity or curiosity or um mm -hmm. you know intent so, you know, in that sense, Bitcoin can probably help, but, you know, that's sort of predicated on the idea that Bitcoin's going to, um, to you know, increase in valuation in the, um, in the coming years, which, which is obviously going to happen. Um, yeah. But, you know, getting people to understand that is, a, is another question. So, yeah, and I, I'll I, shut up there for a second. No, 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 it's just, it's interesting. It's just, I, I was at um, Bitcoin Alive recently, the new, um, the inaugural Australian Bitcoin only conference. And I, I was just speaking to so many people there who, yeah, it just concerns me that it, it's great that you're on this mission and you're doing what you can to spread the word, but they're still living this life of being stuck in a day job that doesn't really solve the societal problem that they're also so passionate about through Bitcoin. So it's just trying to get everyone to realize that just start upping your game as a human being, <laughs> because, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. you know, it, there's, there's a lot of cheesy cliches in the coaching business about, you know, just show up and serve. And it's like, well, I'm too busy worrying about mm -hmm, myself. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, 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 yeah. And it's, yeah, it's, I, I don't know what the answer is, but I guess, trying to bring it back down to when the whole fix the money, fix the world thing. Um, you wrote with Mark Moss, the Uncommunist Manifesto. I was in your Kickstarter, got copies here. Um, Thank you. No, you're welcome. Um, and I, I mean, I wouldn't have even known, apparently it's one of the most influential books of 
all time, but I don't remember learning about it at school. I don't remember even understanding the definition of communism until diving down the Bitcoin money rabbit hole. Um, mm -hmm. And do you do you feel that where we're at, in, particularly in the Western world, is is on the precipice of communism? Is that why you wrote the book? Because I feel like people are starting to converge socialism and com communism and the lines are getting very blurred. Yeah, I mean, okay, so um, I guess the answer is yes, um, but <laughs> the, um, the, the they, they spring from the same sort of root, right, which is um, we, we need to – some bureaucratic organization or setup or apparatus of some sort needs to decide where um, – the resources of a you know a group of people should be deployed how they should be deployed and instead of people deciding what they can do with their own stuff um, they should do it so whether you know the flavor is you know soft communism in democracy you know medium communism in uh, socialism or full-blown communism communism like it, it, you know it's it's all sort of like the same thing um, so you know is is the West going on that Path. I mean, we've we've been going down it for a long fucking time. Um, just to to a different, yeah. So so it's just it's just been to a different degree. And the thing is, it's you know, I, I learned this from Jordan Peterson when he said like, how did the um, the I think like the Nazi prison guards or whatever like how did they become so brutal? And it's like, well, they didn't wake up one morning and become super brutal. Like it's it was inch by inch by inch by inch by inch by inch, and, that, and that's sort of how we've got here. And that's you know why. Uh, you know things like vigilance, etc., are important. But you know, you you sort of like the the you know they say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Um, I you know I might add like it's paved with good intentions that um, that are you know unfounded in terms of their um, their raison d'être. Like so, you just do shit because it sounds nice, um, and you don't think any deeper. And that's sort of what's um, what's brought us here and I mean unfortunately we are definitely up shit creek without a paddle um mm. and you know the only way to um come back is like to put our hands in the shit and paddle fucking back with um you know through the shit until we uh until we you know reach the um the non-shit part of the sh of the of the creek um and you know that that's going to take that's going to take a a whole lot of uh, struggle, um, you know, Bitcoin is a massive part of that. It's a central part of that. But as you said, it's going to take people upping their game. I think, mm. you know, to, to, to sort of tie this back to the entrepreneurial discussion, it's, um, you know, I, I think what's more important is that people, like, do work on things that they actually give a shit about. So, so and, and this doesn't mean that they need to essentially be an entrepreneur, but they can learn a lot from the entrepreneurial uh, mode of being, which is, entrepreneurs yes. solve problems so even if you are not the owner of the business you can take an entrepreneurial approach to what you're doing in a business if you give a shit like so you know you could be a designer who like and, and you fucking love design go find a company that's building something cool that you would love to design and solve the problems in design like or you're an engineer go and work with a company that is building something cool and code up something cool now like th th there's a myriad of these things, and and I think that's probably the more important piece, you know, because mm. th there's there's one thing I'll sort of close out this idea on is um and and I learned this from from Tony Robbins. It's about like he talks about like the entrepreneur, the artist, and the manager leader. Have, have you ever heard this? I know a lot of Tony Robbins, but not that particular one. But I'm, it might ring a bell. Go okay, on. so. This one's this one's fantastic. You know, I learned this one at his uh, business mastery years ago, but it's it's a really good framework. So you have you know th these three archetypes of person when it comes to you know business and you know career. Basically, you have the entrepreneur, you have the artist, and you have the um, manager leader archetype. And essentially, they're all they're all different archetypes, different people, um, different you know modality of uh, operation. So the artist is you know generally someone like a an artist or a, you know, maybe an engineer um, or a, a designer um, or a, you know, a football player or a guitarist or something. They have a Creative. talent. Yeah. Exactly. They have a talent specifically. That, that's probably the, the, the key word there. And 
they can turn that talent into something. So, you know, you see that with like the content creators. Co- content creators are artists. They're not entrepreneurs, mm-hmm. they're artists. They have managed to take their talent or their skill and monetize it in some way. Um, the second uh, archetype you have is the entrepreneur. And so, so the entrepreneur is someone who they might not have a specific talent, but they can bring together people. They can take a bucket load of fucking risk. They can, you know, corral people around a vision uh, towards solving a problem. So, so like they're like the, you know, probably the, the Donald Trumps of the world, you know, or the Elon Musks um, or, you know, maybe in ancient times they would have been like the Alexander the Greats, right? You know, or something like that. They were, they're the people who can really like take on the risk that's associated and they can, you know, go through the gut wrenching process of like, you know, losing everything, starting again, you know, all, all that kind of crap. Um, and they're, they're a second archetype and they're more entrepreneurial in nature. And then sort of the third archetype is the manager leader. And, and that's the person who, you know, they, they, um, you know, they run the show. They're the operations guy. They're the Tim Cook. Yeah. Um, you know, they're the, uh, you know, the, the coach. And, and, and I guess for people to conceptualize it, think of a, think of a, a, a football team, for example, or a basketball team. The mm-hmm. artist is the player. Mm-hmm. The entrepreneur is the owner of the team. Yep. And the manager leader is the coach. The co- yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you need, you need all three. Yeah. Um, and all three can be business owners. Um, but, you know, the idea so, – so what you should do is you should figure out what archetype you are first um, yeah. and then lean into that. Um, yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm less artist. Like I've, I've got some artist obviously because I can write, so I seem to have a talent around that. Yeah. But, you know, and everyone's, everyone's got a mixture of all three, right? Um, so it's not, it's not about like, oh, yeah, you know, you're, you're one, that. right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everyone's got a mixture. Um, yep. but the thing is like, where's your center of gravity? If you put your time into your center of gravity, I think that's where you'll find success. So like I'm primarily entrepreneurial, mm-hmm. bit of artist and you know, the least, uh, manager leader, although I'm strong in that too. Um, it's not where I like to spend my time. Um, I like to spend my time in the entrepreneurial side of things like figuring out, solving a problem and then taking a bucket load of risk to figure it out and potentially losing it all, fucking up, starting again, like all that sort of shit. Um, yeah. and then if I can weave some artistry into it, fantastic. Yeah. And I feel like you've just, that is so brilliant. I love it. I'll clip that out. But I think the issue that I just see in the mainstream or in the masses is just people don't, they can't think their way out of where they're at to even figure that out. Like, and and to me, Mm -hmm. just start something, even if it's a blog or a newsletter. And like you've said, you know, several times I've heard you say that it's so easy to start now. You don't have to be any one of the three but just do something that at least at least gets you excited about creativity to begin with because you've figured out who you are by do- the doing right you've been an entrepreneur mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. you've only figured out which bits of that you are or which which archetype you are sorry by by the doing and people are just so um I guess overwhelmed short on time just busy with life that you can't once you're in that situation it's very difficult to scope out the time to just begin exploring um any of those um and i think for those who have some bitcoin who have that excitement about the future that's great that's hopefully taking away some of the the overwhelm or some of the the financial anxiety it's like okay great what are you going to do with that that time that headspace that excitement um and there's so many people in the bitcoin space especially just building um in Bitcoin, but they could be, I, I feel like there's a lot of people out there with so many talents that they're just not exploring. And, and my coaching background is or coaching foundation is Gallup Clifton strengths, which is all about mm-hmm, your natural mm-hmm, talents. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, it's inspiring because you know, you are this one extreme of the entrepreneurial hustling. I think you even printed your own pay slips at one point. I remember reading. <laughs> <laughs> I've done all sorts of weird shit. Trust me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's the, you are the 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 hardcore. Um, yeah. So I mean, it's it's really interesting hearing your perspective on it because it just people overthink what they can do to contribute. I think, and whether they're in Bitcoin or not, just I would just encourage everyone to take a look at. What would get you excited? What did you maybe switch off from your childhood that got you excited? Um, because, yeah, this this flatlining through life that's happening because of fundamentally broken money is just, it's really concerning. But we do have this, I don't know that Bitcoin is the answer, but it's the only option we've got at the moment. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, and that's why I sort of tied it back to like, you know, Bitcoin will fix the macro situation. Um, and in time, you know, it'll just create different incentives and we are in around ourselves differently and all that sort of stuff. But then it, it, it literally all comes back to, um, you know, the individuals and the choices they're making. Like, you know, on a Bitcoin standard, you can totally be a fucking degenerate, nihilistic moron um, and, you know, do nothing. Like, you know, Bitcoin yeah. doesn't fix you. I'm sorry. Like, no. Um, you know, so, so, so like at least, you know, what a Bitcoin standard does is it, it, it creates a situation where those who want to be better, to do better, to create, to produce, to innovate, to do all that sort of stuff, it gives them a fighting chance where the, the game is not so rigged that, they, um, that they're like, well, why, why the fuck should I do this anyway? Um, and, 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 and that's where you get like, um, you know, you, you get like real scalable progress um and, yes. and that's what the sort of the west has shot itself in the foot with now is like mm -hmm. the game has become so rigged um you know the best of us are building the next dick pick app um or the next stupid ai fucking bot or whatever else it is right mm -hmm. um and the 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 middle of us um uh kind of like kind of given up on life and then the worst of us are like going out there burning buildings down and whatever the fuck else. So it's like it's a really sick society. So, you know, it, it all comes back to, you know, people need to choose better things to do with their time. And, you know, you're going to make mistakes. Man, the amount of stupidities I've done in my life, I would like, I could write, you know, I started, I started writing a book called Hero to Zero in my 20s, which was like <laughs> how I made a million bucks and lost everything, right? So, and it was going to be a story of like the things you shouldn't do. Um and I, I never got around to finishing it. Maybe one day I'll come back and I'll finish it. But I feel like I'm going to need like 10 volumes of that shit because the amount of things I've done wrong is like innumerable. I can't even count like the amount of dumbassness that I've uh, produced in my life. But hey, you know, I'm still here. So but you've you know, I might have done some things right as, as well. An, yeah, that's right. But, but, but you've learned from it because as an entrepreneur and Bitcoin is built on the same kind of um, value system, as an entrepreneur, you are the one that's responsible for that. You are the one that's learned the lessons from that and it's made you better. We're living in this society built on money where it's not, where people aren't held to account. They're just given more money or handed out more money. There's no meritocracy, which I know you've mentioned a lot. You even had some really cool graphics in, I'll link it, Uncommunist Manifesto. But meritocracy and proof of work, I think are the two things about Bitcoin that's missing in society on the current monetary system. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Totally. Like you've learned a lot, but that's yeah, yeah, totally. it was on you. Not We don't get to just yeah. farm out your mistakes to everybody else by paying more tax 10 years from now. Well, yeah, totally. Totally, mm -hmm. totally. And, and um, you know, I think, yeah, like the the, the farming out of the mistakes, like that primarily happens on the, on the bottom end of the social structure and the top end, right? So if you're on the top end, you know, like if you're a Sam Bankman Freed, you can like steal $10 billion and then fly it private, um, or whatever the fuck it is, like, you know, a couple months later. Um, yeah. You know, if you're on the bottom end, you just, like, yell, kick, and scream, and you get given welfare and handouts and whatever. Um, and then, you know, us dumbasses in the middle, we've got to carry both, right? Um, so so that, that kind of sucks. And, that you, you know, you can sort of um, sympathize with people, you know, about why they get nihilistic. In fact, I, I had a bit of a phase last year where I was, like, super fucking nihilistic. I was going down this sort of path of, like, what's the point of everything? Fuck everyone. Like, you know, I... I I went through a bit of a dark phase and like, you know, it, it kind of came out in these like, you know, angry rants on Twitter and stuff like that. And, you know, I triggered a bunch of people and all this sort of crap, but like, you know, it, 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 it can get hard, Human. you know, well, well I, I hope so. Um, <laughs> you know, and like the, you know, the argument is that, you know, we're all sort of humans, um, albeit it seems like we have more NPCs these days than humans, but you know, that's another discussion. Um, but yeah, it's you know, it's 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 unfair and no, nobody likes an unfair situation. Um mm -hmm. but, you know, at the same time, like this is this is the this is the world we're born into. Um and we don't get a rewind button, we don't get a reset button, we don't get any of that sort of stuff. So as unfair as it is, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. So you've got to you've got to do something about that and you know, I, I guess at least you know, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, like you can actually take that um, problem and, you know, at least as a Bitcoin entrepreneur as well, like you can take that problem, you can hopefully do something about it. Um, 
and you know you you might not see the total fruits of your labor i mean i'm sure you can make money and you know do that but i think the bigger impact you'll have longer term is like on how you've helped shift the world so so that there's a lot of big stuff here um we can delve into some of that if you want but like um no. yeah i don't know it's it's not as hopeless as it might seem basically no and i think what's what i love about bitcoin or being exactly what you've just said, like we may not live to see the world on a full Bitcoin standard where, you know, people are peacefully trading with each other and goods and services are no longer manip- prices of, of everything in the marketplace is not manipulated. We, I, I don't think we will live to see that in its full fruition, but feeling like you're moving the world forward and leaving it a better place. I, that's actually think something I think everybody wants. It's in Tony Robbins hierarchy of needs and Maslow's hierarchy of needs and the human needs, sorry, Tony Robbins. Um, and for me, it's like, I'm just going to dollar cost into Bitcoin, dollar cost average into Bitcoin, because that's, I'm, I'm trying to accept it as payment. I'm trying to spend it. Just participating in that ecosystem mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. is helping the world move forward in my little way. And I think the more people that just get that, all of a sudden, their job is less desperate or less um, soul destroying because it's enough mm-hmm, mm-hmm. for us um, but it's also contributing to something for their children for a, a better world yeah you you, you touch on something really important there it's something I've talked about before it's like if you want to live a good life mm-hmm. um, th- th- here's, here's your ingredients basically step one go do something fucking useful with your life that makes you happy and you know even if it's something sorry let, let me Backtrack. Go do something useful life that gives it meaning. Fuck the happiness. Happiness is a byproduct of meaning, right? So yes, do something that gives you some meaning. Um, you'll get happiness. You'll get frustration. You'll get sadness. You'll get mm-hmm. you know uh, anger. You'll get Contrast. excitement. You'll get all the emotions. That's the whole yeah. fucking point, right? So it's exactly. like go do something useful and meaningful mm-hmm. and then make some damn money out of it and put the money into Bitcoin um, and that's it. Rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. That way you, you build a savings, you have optionality because the whole, point of op, the whole point of savings and even the whole point of investing is to have greater future optionality yes. so that you can make your life, uh, I don't want to say easier, but like it gives your life more richness if you use it right. You know, for some people, you give them more optionality, they you know become anxious fucking wrecks or whatever. But you know, that's that's another psychological issue there. Yeah. Which you know, we'll we'll get into that in a future episode. But um, <laughs> you know, the like, if you wanna if you wanna live a good life, honestly, that that's the ingredients there. Um, you know, do, doing it the way that a lot of people are doing it now, as we sort of touched on earlier, is like, you know, working a shit job and then you know desperately trading on the side like a degenerate um mm. ugly life um mm. you know doing you know three jobs ugly life you know trying to save and putting your money in fucking nab or westpac or whatever other stupid bank there is in australia these days ugly life like mm. all that sort of stuff it's all ugly 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 so you know try and make your life more beautiful um by as i said doing something meaningful putting your savings in bitcoin rinse and repeat and 10 years from now you'll be in a much better place Ten years, you reckon? That's the first time. Yeah, I mean, time you know, good things take time. <laughs> I agree. So yeah, good things. Ten years yeah, is good not things long, take but time. It's gonna go. Um, yeah, well, you know, this is a, to quote Tony again. Is like, you know, most people uh, overestimate what they can do in a year and underestimate what they can do in a decade, right? That's and such a good that's one. such a. It's it's one of my favorites, and you yeah. know, and, and I've been I've been a victim of the opposite. Is like I perennially overestimate what I can do in a year, and I've perennially underestimate what I can do in 10 years and like I, I have fucked myself over with this is like I I am too overzealous um and you know if I could go back and get my younger self to understand something it's mm-hmm. you know it would be literally that like if man that would be the one thing I would go and like drill into my head and slap myself across the face and say listen dickhead just be consistent and just Step by step by step by step. Don't try to become, you know, Steve Jobs next week. Like it's not going to happen. Um, yeah. But you know, that that's sort of been, you know, my Achilles heel. I must say. That's perfect because I, my final couple of questions are usually the quick fire of, and that is one of them. Is what would you give? What advice would you give to your younger self about? First of all, being yourself, and, and secondly, money. I think you've kind of tied those two together. There, mm-hmm. just so be be consistent in something you enjoy. 
um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and that gives you meaning. Um, so then the last two questions that I would ask you is just in a nutshell to you, what is money? Which is the per- perpetual question in both Bitcoin and um, anyone trying to educate their friends and family about Bitcoin. I'll steal it from the book, Language of Value. There we go. The Language of Value. Love it. The, ba- the yeah. fu- Was it you said the article or what you said at the conference was the fundamental speech or something i'll go back and put it in the show notes. yeah something like that yeah yeah um does money buy happiness uh it can buy optionality which can lead to happiness um agreed but you know happiness is fleeting it's a it's a really shit north star like i hate when people say you know happiness is the goal that's a dumb goal <laughs> I know I've got it as the tagline on this podcast of freedom and happiness because I think it's what gets more eyeballs I think it's what it's what everybody Mm -hmm, wants mm -hmm. but when you actually ask someone well what does it mean they don't know so this is kind of the conversations from people like yourself I'm trying to dive into um awesome I will link to uncommunist manifesto it's um you've said several times in it and on podcasts it is not ip it is shareable so anyone can go print stuff give it to their friends and family. I think, I mean, it's what, it's a couple of hours less, I think, less than it took me to listen to Yeah, it's a 90-minute read. Yeah, a 90-minute read. Or I think uh, me and Mark read it really slow, so I think it's two hours on Audible. I listened to the Blinkist version of Communist Manifesto as well, and I think it's really important that people actually read yours more than that because the Communist Manifesto, there's such a subtle difference, actually, between some of the things in there and some of what you say but there's just a few things that jump out like it's and this is why the world is where it is it's it's subtle things that sound good like take all the property and and, and abolish it so that everybody's got the same like to a lot of people at first glance that's like a great thing um but what you guys have done is really highlight okay well where does that end because governments don't think like that. they don't think 10 20 50 100 years down the track as a result of that decision yeah, I mean, you gotta you gotta sort of dig a few dig a few layers deeper. I think the the other thing I'll just do, like sort of shameless shill or shameless plug is um if you know if people want to dig a little bit deeper into some of these ideas, particularly if they're newer to Bitcoin, like there's you know Michael Saylor talks about like you know the ten thousand hours in Bitcoin, etc. And and you know all of that is valid, but you know one of the things we're all poor with is like time. So you know I I created a little publication called the Bitcoin Times, yes. um, which it has um what I would consider to be some of the best Bitcoin essays uh, ever written. And there's like, there's five editions at the moment. It's one edition per year. I get the six of the best writers around a particular theme. So like last year was the Austrian edition. So it was like Seyfedean, Bitstein, mm-hmm. Pierre Richard, like a couple awesome writers like that. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, we, we, we produced that. And so if people want to pick up like a collectible of that, um, mm-hmm. so I print 2,100 of them, um, in total of each edition and they're uniquely numbered. So if people want to grab a, a chunk of that, um, they can. And um, yeah, like it, th- th- that's like a way to fast track your understanding of Bitcoin specifically because, mm. it, you know, if, if you increase the quality yeah. of what you're doing, um, you will decrease the quantity of the shit you need to go through to understand a concept. Um, and that's the that's the premise of this little publication. Awesome, and I love that you launched it to one of the two stories. Two years running, you launched things that were in direct opposition to the conference you were asked to speak at. So one was yes. a crypto conference, <laughs> and you talked all about Bitcoin. And then the following year, it was oh, it's a blockchain conference, and you launched the Bitcoin Times. I love that story. People could go and listen to that on um, other podcasts. But it was that to me was just the classic example of someone who is more than willing to. Be, be you and get paid <laughs> I'm like get yeah. to speak at a conference and then just uh, go against the grain <laughs> but you got asked yeah that. and get booted out of the conference yeah well yeah, yes I mean they didn't ask me the third time <laughs> yeah well I think I think you're doing okay yeah, well, um, and have you got this other yeah. book coming is you've mentioned it a couple of times is that on the way or is it on hold what's going on yeah that so that's really cool uh, I love everything to do with Japanese it is, philosophy yeah it is on the way um okay. So it's, uh, I mean, I'm hoping it'll be ready before the end of the year. Like I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like struggling with the editing process. I must admit, like it's driving me crazy. So, um, it's, it's almost there. I think it's going to be 
not to blow smoke up my ass, but I think it's going to be one of the best things I've ever written. It's really, really, really thought provoking. Um, mm. And it was a, it was a total journey to write. So the Bushido of Bitcoin is what that's going to be called. So, um, so yeah, people should keep an eye on that. Yeah. Um, I will link your Twitter's where you're most active, right? Uh, indeed. Um, yeah. you know what, actually flying by the seat of my pants, um, yes. I'm going to do something for anyone who's listening. Um, okay. Is if they want to if they want to pick up a copy of the Bitcoin Times, how about uh, thirty thousand sats off? Um, if they want to pick up a copy, um, give me a code. What should what should we create a code for people so they can get some sats off? Be you get paid. Get some. Okay, done. Be you get oh, paid. No full stops. 000. Nothing. Just one word. That's- Awesome. 30,000 sats off you, the new book, did you say? Oh, no, Bitcoin Times. Uh, off of Bitcoin. Yeah, the Bitcoin Times. Any copy of the Bitcoin Times because that's available now. Yeah. Legend. I will make sure that's all linked up. And uh, yeah, BU Get Paid as a Code is perfect. Great. Thank Done. you. Awesome. For Thank sure. you so much. Thank you, Amy. Thanks so much for taking the time to tune in to this podcast. I really appreciate it. If you found it helpful or useful, or even if you just feel a tiny, tiny bit better for having listened, there's a couple of things you can do that would take a few seconds that I'd really appreciate you taking the time to do. First thing you can do is subscribe wherever you're listening. If that's on a podcast platform, it's usually just pressing the plus sign next to the main show listing page. If you're on YouTube, you can subscribe to the channel or give us a like on the video. If you're feeling really generous, you can leave us a comment or a review. That's either on YouTube or the podcast platforms once again. If you feel like anyone else in your life might benefit from any of the topics that you hear us talking about, feel free to send them an episode. And lastly, Feel free to give me feedback, comments, suggestions, uh, or personal reviews and thoughts and feelings on social media. It's and, and tag me so I can thank you. It's at Amy Taylor says on Instagram or Twitter, or send me an email on Amy at bugetpaid.com. Uh, thanks again for listening. Don't forget to keep being you, keep getting paid, but most importantly, just be happy. Oh, and by the way, if you didn't enjoy it, don't do any of those things. You just go have a nice day, save your time. Thanks.